from the heart of Wrexham. Welcome to the Hope Street Church Podcast. For more information of how to get involved, stay tuned until the end of the episode. Summer series, our summer Sunday series called Songs from the Front Line. And it's about processing life with God before you launch in. And it's all based on the Psalms. So um, I'm going to just frame the series this morning, going to have a quick look at the title, we're going to look at some of the theological stuff around Psalms, we're going to look at what Psalms models for us in terms of wholehearted worship and then we're going to very briefly have a look look at Psalm 100 and Thanksgiving and I've just realised I've completely forgotten to give the team my scriptures so I'm really sorry, there are Bibles on the floor next to you, don't feel you have to follow them but I'm going to... um, Give Jack a little heads up. Psalm 18 is coming, and then Psalm 150, and then Psalm 100 will do. Thank you. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you that you are with us always. Thank you, Father, that you meet us in every season. And so, Father, I just thank you for your word because it spings, speaks life to us. It brings life to us. And I pray that this morning our hearts would be open to hear all that you have for us, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So, songs from the front line, we're talking about psalms. Psalms, as you're probably aware, are like Israel's hymn book. They're like the worship playlists, Israelites, Spotify. You know, it's just, it's their go-to songs. And every song, you will probably know, has a backstory, and the psalms are no different. So this book is written throughout Israel's history. And Israel, if you're new to church and you don't know this, Israel was like the the people of God, God's chosen people. And then the Psalms tell Israel's history, it tells their story. But it's not so much about the facts, the people, the who, where, why, when, what, but more about the celebrations and the pain that they experience as they journey with God. And these songs are a gift Because as the psalmist articulates what they're going through, their words help the generations that follow them to articulate their pain and their anger, or their joy and their hope. So in Psalm 18, in my Bible, it says David's victory song. And it says, how I love you, Lord. You are my defender. The Lord is my protector. He is my strong fortress. My God is my protection, and with him I am safe. He protects me and like a shield. He defends me and keeps me safe. I call to the Lord, and he saves me from my enemies. Praise the Lord. And so this is David's psalm after a victory in battle. And I can imagine that later on in future battles, the Israelites are singing that song again because David's psalm echoed something of their current experience. Of course, there are other psalms that express pain or hopelessness or despair. And these ancient songs gave voice to other Israelites in their seasons of struggles too. Let me ask you a question. What was the first single you bought? If you're old enough to have ever bought singles and it's not all just on Spotify. Um, Now, and why did you buy it? So, I'm glad to see some of you can remember these. I'm, I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to ask you not to judge me too harshly, okay? I was five, this is my defense, when I bought my first single. And I guarantee that probably at least 60% of you will never have heard of this. It was Shawaddy Waddy. <laughs> okay, perhaps it, was, perhaps it was less than 60%. Under the Moon of Love. Don't, don't cut me off your friend list just for that, okay? And um, I was five. Now, there was something about that song that resonated with me. I have no idea. Don't psychoanalyze me or anything or send me for ministry. But at five, there was something in that song about this call for love that struck a chord. But we do this with songs, don't we? Others' lyrics articulate something that we are feeling and we literally sing our heart out. They help us connect with our emotions and express them. I mean, we do that in worship week in, week out, don't we? What about the classic time? Is Now, I imagine many of you experienced this. 
I hope it's not all of you, but you know that breakup time? We find the sad songs, we lie on the couch, we wallow in our pain, nursing our broken hearts. Uh, my birthday is just before Christmas, you can make a note if you like. And um, I remember this time when I was 16 and um, I'd just experienced a breakup. I had the house to myself, I turned the lights down low, I was feeling quite sad. And I put on, you see again, most of you won't know these songs, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I had It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To on repeat, <laughs> followed by Simon and Garfunkel's Trouble, uh, what is it, Bridge Over Troubled Water. And then the Beatles, yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. And obviously, they, some of those songs have obviously had a resurgence, because most of you knew those. I was quite surprised. But it might be a different song for you. And you've probably just clocked which one it was. Our eldest was in her teens when Taylor Swift first kind of rose to fame and we'd have some of her stuff playing in the car and her melodies of tragic breakthrough would be blasting out and we are never, ever, ever getting back together. <laughs> of course, it's not just about heartbreak. It might be love songs, mightn't it? If you're married, you may have had a particular song that you walk down the aisle to and it's, there's something about it. Songs help us unlock something within so that we can engage with our inner world. And it's critical. So let's have a quick look at the Psalms and some of the theology around it. Don't get too caught up in the words. They're just giving us hooks to hang these ideas on. But the Psalms sit in tandem with the narratives that tell Israel's history. From being chosen as God's people, inheriting their land rebellion and exile and then restoration and return to Jerusalem. It's a long history with many contrasting seasons. And each psalm, um, it's no surprise that in, in these psalms we see these varying moods depending on the season that Israel is in. And there's an American theologian called Walter Brueggemann and he describes these moods using these three words. Orientation, disorientation and reorientation and um, so I want to kind of unpack that a little bit this morning orientation is when all is well everything in the garden is rosy for me it's like the sun is shining you've got the windows rolled down in the car you've got happy tunes playing the road ahead is clear there's nothing to worry about Life couldn't be better in this season. And thanks and praise are effortless. Psalm 150 is an example of this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him when the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. I think we'd possibly change some of the instruments if we were writing that now. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And it's that almost like this gush of praise. It's so easy to praise God in that season. The Psalms of Orientation are songs of praise and thanksgiving, celebrating God's goodness. This season has no reason to doubt God's goodness, his faithfulness, his power, his grace, kind of because it hasn't been challenged. The pitfall, of course, of that season is the tendency to forget that all we are and all that we have is because of who he is. And it's easy to become complacent, self-sufficient, self-reliant when all is well. So we just have to guard against that. And we see Israel fall into that pit a few times. The second phase is disorientation. Now, that's a word we might feel a bit more familiar with. We know what it's like to feel dis um, I can't say it, disorientated. Um, it's when something happens, when we suddenly feel like our life has been jackknifed. Everything we thought we knew, we question. A tragedy, a pain, loss, 
disappointment, sin. And these songs are very different. In these times, it's hard to bring praise and thanksgiving. That's when truly, um, it's a true sacrifice to bring your praise. These are the tough times. Times of confession in Psalm 51, for example. Lament in Psalm 6. Anger, Psalm 109. Intercession, Psalm 40. Just to give you a few. And we're going to look at some of those topics in coming weeks. The beautiful thing about the Bible is it doesn't hide the ugly bits. And so here in the Psalms, we see the psalmist's raw emotion. And just to say, it's not always good theology. We do read about David wanting vengeance on his foes, and that doesn't really line up with what Jesus would teach. So we do need to be careful, but it is real and it is authentic. God, for our own good, sometimes doesn't answer the prayers that we pray in those seasons because he knows that we're venting and we're trying to figure out what is going on. Pete Hughes calls times of disorientation a temporary necessity. They are necessary to walk through the dark valley and back out into the wide open spaces. But they're temporary because we're not going to be singing them in heaven because he will have wiped away every tear. And then the third thing is reorientation. This is when you've come through the other side, and these songs are marked with thanksgiving for bringing the psalmist through disorientation. Um, There's a knowing depth that comes across. Like, I've been through this. And in these songs of reorientation, we see gratitude connects the psalmist with the giver. And it leads us to intimacy. So, for example, Psalm 139. I'm going to pick a couple of verses, not all of it. And you might be familiar with this, but it says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. These are the words of someone who knows. They've been in the depths and they found God there and they know. It's like um, Miriam's song. You know, when the Israelites were led out of Egypt, they had this thing where the Egyptians chased them. God brought the water down over them, drowned the Egyptian army. I know it sounds grim, but Miriam and the Israelites are the other side And they're like, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. You know, they've been through fear, terror, oppression, slavery, and they're through the other side. And she comes and gives thanks, and saying, both horses and driver, he's hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. Now, these three moods that Brueggemann um, describes as a cycle of orientation, and that's really important because we're not meant to get stuck in any one or live in any one of them permanently. They, they communicate Israel's journey through orientation, through moments of disorientation, and through back to reorientation. They are part of their story with God, and so they help us with our story with God. So if we think about how they help us, what can we learn from these psalms in terms of how they model wholehearted worship? I was thinking about when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, a woman who was despised for her story, a woman who was staying hidden because of pain and shame, which he knew about, incidentally, and crossed every social Um, political, religious boundary to meet her in her pain. And he said to her, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, the Psalms model bringing our whole lives into our conversation and relationship with God so that we can bring wholehearted worship Now, the Israelite worldview was that God was in every circumstance. So if they found themselves in a mess, they knew 
he was there with them and, uh, and that he would be the one to deal with it. So when they were through the other side, they recognized that it wasn't just that time is a healer, but God is. He is the one who heals. He is the one that brings them through. So the Israelite hope is pinned on God. And it kind of, for me, threw a bit of light on why they are able to come in all this raw emotion before God in the Psalms, whereas maybe, I don't know if it's just me, whether it's a Western worldview, whether it's just a British stiff upper lip. We want to clean up our mess and get rid of the ugly bits before we come to God. But this is the gospel, isn't it? Jesus walked into our messy lives to bring life. Bono was being asked about songwriting and writing worship songs and and he said a few things, but one of the things he said was, I want to write songs that touch the agony and ecstasy of the human experience. Because that's who we are. We're not the people of the middle, we're, we're people of breadth. These songs and psalms help us unlock emotions we haven't, that haven't been touched. And when we do that before God, we invite in the healer. Worshipping in spirit and in truth includes articulating our inner world in all its reality. The Psalms often help us do that by giving us the words to express what's in our hearts. Vulnerability builds strong relationships. Brene Brown, who is a researcher, author, speaker on um, vulnerability and shame and a few other things around that highlights emotional exposure as one of the three key elements of vulnerability. But she also says that vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability and authenticity. If you want to cultivate deeper relationships, you have to take your armor off. No matter how vulnerable it makes you. Expressing our emotions to God builds our intimacy. When we suppress it, when we keep our armor on, when we stop being vulnerable, we limit our experience of God. Let's have a quick look at Psalm 100. And it's um, at, the, at the top, in my Bible it says, a psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Now there's a whole lot in that psalm that we could dig through and you'll probably be glad to know I'm not going to do all that today. But in the Psalms of Orientation, praise flows easily and it often looks descriptive. It's like it refers back to what God is like as creator. You know, he's done this, he's thrown, flung the stars into space and it just talks about the order that he brings and it kind of um, leans into a confidence in God's reliability and trustworthiness. But in reorientation, thanksgiving flows and the psalm takes a more declarative tone like there's a declaration this is who God is and, and in this one here it says for the Lord is good and his love endures forever some scholars rather than talking about orientation they talk about naivety and it doesn't matter particularly about the words unless it just helps you uh, connect and so um orientation they use the word naivety it's that place where nothing has come against them to challenge their faith in the goodness of God the trustworthiness of the reliable one and reorientation they call the second naivety or the post-critical again you don't really need to remember all that stuff but I just really identify with it because as a new Christian there was little that challenged my view that God 
was good. You know, it was just an unblemished, unscarred view of who he was. But it meant that my roots were fairly shallow. A season came when I felt like my world crumbled. Uh, and I would have been diagnosed with depression if I'd not been too proud to go to the doctors. The pain of the circumstances triggered... Um, sorry, the pain that it triggered, like was threatening to sink me. I was definitely disorientated. Like, I felt like my world had been turned upside down. And, and if you recognise, you know, the sound of that season, you'll know that choosing God in the tough times is such a hard thing to do. You're swimming against the tide. And one of the easiest things to do would have been to throw in the towel. And I'm so grateful to God for his grace that enabled me to cling on, sometimes by my fingernails. And I know you're kind of dying to hear the rest of that story, and you're not going to. But I would say this. Um, I can honestly say when I came through the other side that I was thankful for the experience. And that might sound a bit strange. I was thankful that he brought me through. I wasn't particularly thankful for the actual events, but I was thankful for the fruit that was the result of the struggle, the roots that went deeper in my relationship with him, the growth of faith and trust, the developing self-awareness, the knowledge that he is who he says he is, and he steps in. The reality that scripture has power to break you free from lies, from fear, from all kinds of stuff. And the comfort that I received, I knew I was then able to give away because it was a real thing. Thanksgiving in reorientation is able to say, he is good or he is faithful or he is the healer or however it is you have experienced him because it declares truth from experience and in psalm 100 it has the hallmarks of reorientation it starts with for the lord is good and it doesn't start with it at all it's verse five the lord is good and his love endures forever his faithfulness continues through all generations but it also teaches us that gratitude draws us into the presence of the giver because it says this Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So that journey of vulnerability is an essential part of our journey into his courts of praise. The raw emotions we ex experience in disorientation and express in disorientation pave the way for gratitude and thanksgiving in reorientation. And they lead us into greater intimacy than with the one we praise. And I just want to finish with this quote. There's a, there was a guy speaking at Focus. His name was Rich Velodas. I'm not sure if I've said that properly, but he said this. I thought it was quite fitting, so we'll wrap up with it. The book of Psalms is a prayer book for the people of God. They give us words to pray when we don't have words. They are the language of authentic, raw emotions describing the human condition before God. They are to become our words. Listening to emotions is essential for reality, and God only dwells in reality. Would you like to stand with me? We're going to pray. Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus, I thank you that when you called us, you knew us, all of us, from beginning to end. You knew every season we would go through, and you knew that you would be with us in it all. So Holy Spirit, we just ask you now to come and meet with us. And just plant those, those seeds deep in our heart that we need to take away today. Those areas that we've kept hidden give us courage to unlock them. Those things we thought we couldn't bring before you. 
Help us know that we can. And I just pray, Father, that your word would give us words when we don't have any. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to the Hope Street Podcast. We're a church in Wrexham with a vision to be a people of hope, following Jesus and giving ourselves a way to see Wrexham in you. To find out more, head to our website, hopestreet.church, or follow us on social media.